Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Koreans sure like to watch movies. Last year, the domestic film industry made more money than ever before. One movie in particular was seen by no less than a third of the population. Korean cinema has also been able to establish itself abroad, with blockbusters such as Old Boy or Snowpiercer being among the most famous examples. In this episode, we dive into the Korean movie ecosystem in order to learn more about the reasons for this success, both domestically and abroad, but also to look at the differences between mainstream and independent movie making, as well as the political environment shaping the industry. To navigate the realm of the Korean silver screen, there is probably no better guy than Simon McEntegart, Korean movie buff and founder of one of the best reference sites for Korean cinema on the internet, hangukyeonghwa.com. We had the pleasure of welcoming him as our guest for this episode of Korea and the World. Simon fell in love with Korean cinema while pursuing a bachelor in film and art studies, which he complemented with a master's degree in film and visual theory. After lecturing for three years at university level, Simon moved to South Korea, where he's been living since then, working as an independent film critic. Simon McEntegart, welcome to Korea and the World. I hope I didn't destroy your name. <laughs> <laughs> Just a tad. It's uh, McEntegart, but you were close enough. Thank you. <laughs> I want to ask you the question that we ask all our guests. Why Korea? Oh, wow, that's a pretty complex question, really. When I was a student in England, I studied Korean movies and fell in love with them as a student. Uh, I then became a, a teacher at the university as well and started developing an interest in Asian cinema. And um, the, the industry in England just isn't particularly good. So I decided I love Korean movies. I think it's about time I moved there and started exploring the industry further. And ultimately, it was film and cinema that brought me to this country, and it was the best decision I've ever made. How did you discover Korean movies as such? Was it in, in college or...? As university, mostly. Uh, I was introduced to Korean film through an Asian cinema module, and I saw films from directors Park Chan-wook and uh, Kim ki Dak and a few others. And there was also a Asian film festival, and I remember going there with just a couple of friends, and we were the only people in the movie theatre at that time because so many people hated subtitles and the film that we saw was A Bittersweet Life by Kim ji Yoon, and it was just an incredible gangster action movie and it blew us away and that memory has stayed with me forever so it was those experiences that made me think yes I need to go and explore more of this cinema and now I'm here and I'm exploring it every day what did you find, I would say, so amazing in the Korean movies you saw as a, as a college student? Because I know that a lot of people fell for Chinese movies or maybe, you know, the old uh, Hong Kong classics. Mm. Well, they're definitely very appealing. They're very different as a national cinema. But with Korean films, there is this wonderful conflict that goes on within them, almost as a subtext. There's the idea of Han, uh, which is the idea of some kind of sadness uh, within the narrative structure. There's this conflict between old and new because Korea developed so quickly. There's the Confucian ideals that conflict with sort of a more Western influence that has seeped in in more recent years. And that's just a subtext. That's not even inside the, the main story often. So there's so many themes going on. And, and just when you think something is going to happen a particular way, it will veer off into a completely new direction. So it's quite an unpredictable cinema as a whole. And that, that for me is why it's so appealing. And that is something you couldn't find in Western cinema or, or British movies? Uh, not really. Uh, with British cinema, it's very socio-realist and the industry is just dead, really, in the country. With American films, uh, particularly since 9-11, it seems to be very gung-ho, post 9-11 issues of let's go kick some ass kind of attitude. Very predictable oftentimes. But Korean cinema is totally different. It just goes in new territories and that is what keeps it so fresh and appealing. So you said there is a uniqueness to Korean movies. Is there a profile to the movies that Korea produces or, you know, what works in Korean cinemas? What's so special about them? Well, that's a tough one to answer. Um, because it depends on what genre you're actually talking about. A healthy dose of melodrama always seems to go down well with Korean audiences. With period dramas, you need to have a lot of colour and you've got to capture the vibrancy of the era that's being explored. With thriller films, you have to make sure there's enough twists and turns and Han, concept of Han being put in there. 
So it all depends on what genre you're actually looking at. But more specifically, is there any kind of subgenre that seems to be, you know, a major story here in Korea? There has been a tendency more recently to capture the recent past with the very rapid modernization that Korea has experienced. So there has been a tendency for uh, films that are geared more towards a slightly older or middle-aged audience to try and remember all of the ordeals that they went through. But um, it, it always goes in trends and fashions. You kind of get periods like that. Um, this year in particular, we're getting a trend of period films coming out. And that's largely thanks to the popularity of Masquerade a couple of years ago featuring Lee Byung Hun. So yeah, it, it's just like any other cinema really. It has fads, it has trends, it has these popular moments. And uh, what we're seeing now is a, a flurry of activity for period films, which is great for the industry. Speaking of trends, uh, there is definitely a penchant in Korea for historical movies, especially those uh, set in the 14th, 15th, 16th century. Um, why aren't people so you know, intrigued and interested in this kind of filmmaking? Well, in 2014, Korea went through some pretty awful situations. Uh, the Sewol ferry disaster, for example. And when you go back to exploring those particular times, Korea was much more... It, ha it had a much stronger sense of national identity because they were fighting against Japan a lot of the time and against colonization. So those films actually generate a sense of togetherness for the audience and that's why, a, well, a big reason why they proved so popular. For example, uh, The Admiral or Myongryang, uh, that was huge. It broke all box office records, was the biggest film in Korean cinema history and a lot of people attributed that to the fact that Korea had such a terrible year in terms of, uh, sort of political and social disasters and uh, there's a lot of disillusionment within the country but this seemed to unify people and when a film has the power to do that that's particularly impressive. Would you say these movies create a, a positive or a negative unity because if I understand well it's again defining Korea as different or even against Japan and not defining Korea as just Korea, not always, you know, against somebody else or another country. Well, that's a very good point, and it's something that critics have been debating about for a few months. And it's got actually more momentum since Ode to My Father or Gu Jie Shijang has came has come out. It is positive in the sense that it seems to unify people together, but it's also negative in the fact that it does create this. Um, well, for example, with the Admiral, Eastern Shin is elevated from an, an Admiral to a deity of sorts, to sainthood. And of course, I'm sure he wasn't like that in real life. So there is a danger in glossing over certain moments of history. Uh, within that film as well, Eastern Shin was actually tortured by the Korean government due to some false information by a Japanese spy. But in the film, they glaze over it over about 30 seconds, mm. they cover that. And there is a danger with these kind of patriotic movies that it generates fervor rather than an interest in the era, so to speak. So it has its good and its bad moments, but uh, it's always good for debate when these films come out. But there is a, a sentiment, I think, especially amongst the amongst international audiences, that Korean filmmakers have a tendency to rewrite or at least edit out some difficult parts of Korean history. Is that, is that fair or does that happen anywhere else in the world anyway? It does. Um, it happens in every country. I mean, if you look at American Sniper, the whole of that film, it, it's taken in the autobiography and it's changed it. And the autobiography is now being called into question as to whether that is true. <laughs> so um, it, unfortunately, it is something that happens with every country. But you have to expect that with cinema. There is an element of artistic license. The problem is, of course, when you create polar opposites of us and them, good and evil, when you don't blur those boundaries, when you don't characterize your characters as fully rounded human beings, then it does create some problems such as anti-Japanese sentiment. And that's already huge as it is. It doesn't really mm -hmm. need any more uh, flaming of the fans. But um, it's something that every cinema has to deal with, unfortunately. But would you say the Korean movie industry is following a national narrative that has already been defined or is it creating that narrative and in that sense it would actually have a pretty huge role? Well we are living in a time where there's a very conservative government and it does seem to be following that conservative trend but as long as uh, President Park Geun-hye is happy uh, she actually came out and said that The Admiral and Ode to My Father were wonderful patriotic <laughs> films and more people should see them that is the time that we live in. It's conservative, 
and uh, that's why we're seeing this influx of films in this manner. So Japan gets a harsh treatment in Korean movies um, for, I would say, obvious reasons. But the U.S., which is supposedly, you know, Korea's biggest ally, is also treated, I would say, rather roughly. Uh, if I'm correct, in 2006, there was a movie called The Host. Mm. And there an American scientist releases a monster in Seoul in 2012 and returned to base. The U.S. government starts a nuclear, almost starts a nuclear war with North Korea in The Flu 2013. The Americans even intend to airstrike civilians. How do you explain that? Is well, I can explain it through uh, cultural imperialism. Really, um, a lot of Americans believe that they came to Korea and helped the situation, and they did for their part. However, the cultural imperialism was a huge factor at the time, um, and a lot of Koreans of a certain age are still very upset at this influx of American cultural forms that have come into Korea, have become mainstays. So they tend to view America as an interfering bully. And that's why we get films like, uh, you mentioned the flu, they're planning to do an airstrike. They actually overruled the president's orders and things like that. The, the host is a really good one that you mentioned. That's actually a true story. Not the monster, hmm. but, uh, the, <laughs> but the dumping of chemicals into the Han River. That is actually based on fact. They dumped chemicals into the river and it only came out uh, through a scandal. Someone released some documents. So Koreans do tend to view America as sort of a bullying cultural imperialist, but that is a certain age. Uh, the younger generation don't view them as that. It's, it's just sort of middle and older generations. That's why there's such a, an interesting mix of representation. And what about the rest of the world? How are they usually portrayed in Korean movies? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, for example, Korea has a, an issue right now with brides from the southeast of Asia. And uh, independent cinema is actually exploring those issues of domestic violence that they have to endure and things like that. So that's a very interesting one. The Chinese get a bit of a rough ride often. Um, a good example is Mr. Go. It's about a uh, baseball playing gorilla. It's a very, very unique film. That was a co-production with Korea and China. And that had Chinese, Korean and Japanese characters within the film. And in the film, the Chinese were portrayed as low-level gangsters. The Koreans were kind of a mid-level um, sort of businessmen, and the Japanese were the heads of conglomerates. And a lot of people had an issue with the film, saying, what are you trying to say about racial representation within this film? Luckily for my part, with uh, Brits, we tend to get represented as gentlemen, which is completely <laughs> untrue. <laughs> if they've been to the country, they would know that's totally false, but we seem to have that rep representation. You mentioned uh, people from Southeast Asia. Do they also get this negative publicity in movies as unfortunately they do in the press or generally in... in um, it's mixed. They do tend to be a little bit more positive uh, because they're exploring certain issues such as um, mixed race, parentage. Uh, My Little Hero, for example, that had a small Filipino boy who went on to do a singing competition. Um, but it tends to be more independent realm that explore the real nitty-gritty areas of what children of these marriages have to deal with, what the, the brides have to deal with. So independent film is where the, the real investigation lies. And do these independent films have an audience or do they remain unfortunately very uh, confined to connoisseurs? Unfortunately they are confined a lot. Uh, if you're a film festival, uh, if you're a cineast, uh, then definitely you can see these films there. They do tend to get limited releases nationwide but you do have to seek them out, which is quite a frustration. So whenever I can, I try to, if I find a film that explores these issues, I try and promote it as much as possible through social media. As a foreign critic, uh, do you have, a, I would say, a sizable Korean followership? Or do you, are you also yourself circumscribed to the foreigner uh, diaspora here in, in Korea? It's an interesting mix because I get a lot of English-speaking people coming to my website to see what, what's new, what's coming out, what, what they should be excited about. But then I also get Korean audiences who are interested in what foreigners think of particular films. And also film professionals, they come and visit as well just to see what foreigners are saying about these films they're producing and what audiences may think if this film were to go abroad. So yeah, it, it's an interesting mix. So uh, I try to cater to everyone, but it's not easy. <laughs> Speaking about the uh, Korean movie industry, it's interesting to see that the production of movies and the ownership of cinemas very often overlap. It's always the same companies. 
does this affect what is actually shown in the cinema? And what are the consequences if you're a producer and, you, and you're not in the loop, so to speak? That is a very controversial question. It's actually a big issue right now with lawmakers and politicians in Korea. The reason is because the Korean film industry is very much like the old Hollywood studio system back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Companies can invest, produce and distribute all in the same company. So they monopolize it. But the problem is, what can you do about the situation? Because in Korea, there are so many chebols, uh, the big family-owned conglomerates, and that is what is running, essentially, the cinema industry. They control everything. So it is hard for other companies and perhaps films with lesser budgets to get through into big cinemas. A, a good example is The Admiral. That film broke all box office records. But if you think about what other films were released at that time, there was How to Train Your Dragon 2, Guardians of the Galaxy, and both of those films were huge hits worldwide. But in Korea, they were on maybe one screen or two screens in the cinema, whereas The Admiral had sort of seven, eight, nine, ten. So there is a real issue going on right now. Actually, it's interesting you say that now because there's a producer, he just put uh, an open letter online to Park and Hay, the administration. Mm. He um, just did a film, How to Steal Your Dog. And he, he's had to actually resign because he couldn't find enough cinemas, he couldn't find enough investment for his film. And in his open letter, he states the reason he had to do this is because of the monopoly that is run by these chebols. And it is a very serious issue. The FTC has just um, fined two companies. They fined them 5.5 billion won each because of this particular issue. And it's still an ongoing um, issue right now. So we don't know if that the fine is going to stick or not, or things are going to change. But this monopoly is kind of strangling a lot of these independent films and low-level companies that are trying to come through, which isn't so healthy for the industry. Do we see lawmakers uh, making a move there? or is... I think their hands are tied, really, mm -hmm. because when it comes to chebols, if you start with one company, if you try to dismantle one, where do you stop? Because all of the companies like Samsung and LG, do you then continue on to the other areas of industry? I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately. I think what will happen is a lot of the big film companies will just amalgamate these lower companies with, within themselves and just try to produce them through uh, maybe a, a separate line, you know, like how uh, Fox Pictures has Fox Searchlight. Mm. I think that's what we're going to see more of. In the near future, or is that just, you know, wishful thinking? A little bit of Well, both. hopefully, yeah. <laughs> if you're an indie uh, movie maker in Korea, how can you, let's say, move up the ladder and get mainstream? Because if we look at the US, for example, if you're at Sundance, there's a good chance you may be picked up by a, a major movie company and then you'll have access to cinemas. Is that possible in Korea? It is. A lot of it is through positive word of mouth. Uh, that It's hard to say like, just how powerful that is in Korea. Word of mouth is huge, huge business. An indie film like Hang Gong Ju, which is absolutely phenomenal film, that was picked up by, I think it was CJ, and they decided to release it through, not, not their main company as such, but through an art house production arm of the company and that did huge business that broke records when it came out a recent film got released in november and through sheerly through positive word of mouth it became the highest grossing indie of all time it was the documentary my love don't cross that river and that is purely through word of mouth so it is possible for these films to break out and, and to get recognition, but it's certainly not easy for them. But still have a feeling in, in Korea you really have two different worlds, indie and mainstream, whereas in other markets, and especially in the US, there is more, let's say, cross-border mm. <laughs> stuff going on there. So is it, is it just because of the industry structure, as, we, as you mentioned, or is there something maybe more cultural there at play? There is a hierarchy. Uh, in Korea, hierarchy is extremely important. Um, so yes, so there is an element of that, but a lot of it is just creative freedom. The indie films do tend to explore social issues rather than commercial films, which is more about pure entertainment. So it really does depend what the situation is. Sometimes they, the indie filmmakers can sell it to these big companies for distribution. It all depends on what audiences want, unfortunately. 
A good example earlier in the year is the film Another Family. That film explored how Samsung had actually uh, given leukemia to some of its workers. So that film was hugely controversial. And when it, it tried to get a release date, it was suppressed by all of the big chains. And they ended up, uh, through public outcry, they had to reverse their decision and start showing this film more often. But we can see how these ties through these big businesses can actually affect the distribution of these small films. It is a real shame. So it's extremely difficult then in Korea to produce documentaries or you know, investigation and then get it distributed. It's not so difficult to produce documentaries, but investigative documentaries, mm-hmm. very, very difficult. The documentary in Busan Film Festival last year about the Sewol disaster, huge controversy over that because the government got involved, the Busan mayor got involved, and they tried to forcibly have that film removed from the festival. They refused and they screened it. And it it is an incredibly powerful film. Uh, I saw it at the premiere, I was very fortunate. But they are now having problems. The uh, director of the film festival is now trying to be forced out. Hmm. And the reasoning behind it is some kind of tax issues. But everyone is saying, well, actually, the real reason is showing this documentary. So investigative documentaries that criticize openly Korean culture or certain people it is hard to get them out there in the public eye. But if you're doing a documentary that's quite jovial and quite pleasant, or something that's (laughs) anti-Japan, then it can get out there quite easily. Uh, That would be obviously a whole other discussion, but doesn't it tell us a lot about, you know, the political atmosphere currently in Korea, that there is, you know, I would say a strengthening of conservative power, and that if you do not, you know, shed positive light on the country, it's more difficult to get the word out well it's always been like that to a certain degree there has always been that element if you look at anything involved in the korean wave it is about marketing korea as this uh, wonderful land if there's anything critical it tends to be suppressed which is a real shame unfortunately Uh, but the oscars are a good example of that Uh, korean films could easily win oscars easily But the committee that selects the films, they they purposefully choose films that show Korea in this particular light. Anything that is critical or character-driven tends to be overlooked. And it's a real shame, but it's a marketing device, unfortunately. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about it? Because my feeling is that if you look at you know the history of Korea in the last 50 years, the country is slowly graduating you know, from developing to developed country. And now mm-hmm. Korea is in this phase where it wants to show off, so to speak. And so it needs you know a positive story. But at some point, Korea, as, as a member of the OECD, you know, as, as a strong economy, will probably at some point you know reach that level of confidence where they can accept criticism, whether it's from abroad or from the inside. Is that fair? Um, well, it's interesting that you say that because uh, Korea has, it, it went from the poorest nation to one of the richest in such a short amount of time. And they want recognition for it, which is totally understandable. What they don't want is recognition of the problems that are on in society. They don't want people to, to really know too much about that on an international scale because that tends to cause embarrassment. And that an embarrassment is a really big deal, especially for older Korean people. Yeah, there is this idea of marketing this particular view of Korea. And since we have a a very conservative government in power right now, that has strengthened. Um, A few years ago, there was actually a film about uh, Park Chung-hee's assassination of current President Park Geun-hye's father, who was a military strongman leader. And that film is actually a comedy by director Im Sang-soo. It kind of shows the assassination in a very comical light, And it shows uh, Park Chung-hee in a very, very negative light. But that kind of film couldn't be made these days because of the strengthening of the defamation laws. So it's very, very difficult to get your criticisms out there in the open. Speaking of the uh, political context, uh, you are yourself a jury member of Korean Film Award here in Seoul. Uh, Yes, the Wildflower Film Awards. It's uh, set up to celebrate Korean independent film. Did you also feel maybe some kind of political pressure or at least are people always, you know, aware that they should be careful in selecting movies or ratings? Uh... Well, I've not felt any pressure. I think you always have to be aware that there are certain people you have to please. But with independent cinema in general, 
the best films are ones that explore certain issues within society. So you can't really escape controversy when it comes to independent cinema. So uh, th there's no pressure or anything like that, but we are aware that there is a situation, but that won't affect any decisions made. Moving to the uh, international context, South Korean cinema has become quite popular abroad, especially when it comes to crime thrillers, which is something you actually mentioned on your blog. What sets Korean production within this genre, you know, apart from what is made abroad? Why do movies such as Old Boy get remakes in America? Why did they reach cult status? Well, it's interesting that you say the word abroad, because um, if you take different areas of the world, it's different in each part. For example, in Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, films aren't that popular. It's the TV dramas that are huge businesses and the romantic comedies, the melodramas. With Europe, it's a lot of art house films tend to be uh, the big successes, like from directors Hong Sang-soo and Kim Ki-duk. In England and America, it does tend to be thrillers. A few years ago, it used to be horrors, but that seemed to have died out. And yet now it seems to be the thrillers that are popular. Um, some films like Old Boy that you mentioned, that becomes cult because of the themes with which it deals. But like we were talking earlier, it, it's the different directions, the unpredictability that uh, Korean thrillers offer. And that is why they are so attractive to be remade in American cinemas. But when they do get remade, there's general outcry from film fans, like, why does it need to be remade? Just read the subtitles. Um, and as we saw with Spike Lee's remake of Old Boy, it died, completely failed at the box office. So I, I think the appeal does tend to be with the twists and turns, the inventiveness. Like in, in Old Boy, again, the idea of a claw hammer being mm. a weapon. Um, you know, that's, that's not common. That wouldn't really come into Western filmmakers' minds to use that. They would think of something like a blade or some kind of gun. But they're always inventive, Korean filmmakers, and that's what makes them so exciting. So Korean movies are definitely becoming more uh, successful, more known abroad. In turn, does it have any impact on the domestic production that movies are becoming, let's say, less Korean, because if they are less Korean, they are easily marketable uh, in the West or at least abroad? That is a very, very interesting thing you say. Right now, it's not so much America, I'd say, it's China that's the big influence. America is trying, or well, Hollywood, is trying to move into the Chinese market, but so is Korea. Korea is starting to do co-productions with China. They're starting to branch out into that realm. So there is an element within the industry where they're trying to cater to Chinese audiences as well. So that's, that's a very interesting move right now. But uh, because of the success of Korean films, one of the things we are seeing is the scale of the budgets getting much, much higher than they were previously, which is good and bad. It's, it's stopping inventiveness, but it also it's making the quality of the, the sets and the costumes so much grander and much more luxurious than what we've ever experienced before. But in a business sense, it also means less returns. So, hmm. so it is a very complex realm. When you speak of China, I had the feeling that in China, Korean drama, TV series are actually way more uh, popular than movies. Or is there like a changing trend there? You're right. It is. A lot of TV dramas are very huge over there. Certain stars like Lee Min Ho were enormous, enormous draws over there. And because, uh, well, if we take Lee Min Ho again for an example, if he makes a film, that film will be successful over there. So certain stars will actually sell certain productions in various countries. Korean dramas are definitely very popular in Asia, but I would say that in the West, it's more the other way around. Korean movies are very popular and Korean drama are not watched and sometimes even disliked because people mm -hmm. think they are very uh, conservative or, as you said, melodramatic, over mm -hmm. the top. How, how do you explain this dichotomy between the two markets? Asia or Southeast Asia and the West. Wow, that's, that's a tough one because we have to talk about sort of culture and history when it comes to that kind of thing. Well, in England and America, we used to see... Well, we, we're not fans of cliché, ultimately. Uh, we're not fans of cliché. We are quite modest when it comes to our emotions, but in Southeast Asian countries, that's the opposite. There's an enjoyment that comes from these predictable pleasures. This, the cliché actually gives audiences this enjoyment. When there is melodrama, Asian audiences do identify with that because when they grieve or when there's a situation, they do express themselves quite openly. Whereas, for example, in England, we would tend to stifle it and keep it within. 
So what we may term as melodramatic, Southeast Asian audiences would deem as completely normal. So I, I would think that was a big part of it. Movies don't tend to adhere to those kind of rules. They don't really feature those kind of melodramas unless they are explicitly rom-coms or things like that. So that's why movies tend to be more popular in North American and European territories. When it comes to recognition abroad, and I think you already touched upon it a bit, um, no Korean movie was ever nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards. Uh, if we look at Japan, actually, it's over a dozen nominations so far. Why does Korean cinema seemingly doesn't get much attention. It's mostly due to this particular committee. The films that they submit to the Oscars tend to be ones that present Korea in a very positive light. Mm. This year, for example, the film uh, Hemu was submitted to the Oscars, and that is a commercial thriller. That is actually quite critical of Korea. It's based on a true story. But when has a commercial movie ever won an Oscar? Uh, if you look at the other possibilities. We've got Han Gongju, which looked at a sexual abuse case. We've got A Girl at My Door, who looks at sort of immigration and um, sexuality, people on the fringes of society. And those films have gone to multiple festivals around the world, and they weren't selected. So there is a very conscious decision going on here. Let's put these particular movies forward, rather than the character-driven social explorations, which win Oscars. And these films could win Oscars if they were given a chance. Uh, last year's another example, Jisul, which is about the Jeju-do massacre, when Korean troops actually massacred their own people on Jeju-do, and no one really talks about it these days. That film is a piece of art. It's beautiful, and it wasn't submitted. A different film called Juvenile Offender was submitted, mm. and that's more about a relationship between a mother and son. So yeah, there are films in Korea that could quite easily be in the shortlist for an Oscar, but it all just depends on the attitude of the committee. And if they want to uh, put forth a particular image of Korea, they will make their selection based on that. It's a bit paradoxical because if a Korean movie would ever win an Academy Award, then they would receive what they're all craving for here, that recognition mm. from the Temple of Cinema. That's the problem. They would get the recognition, but there would be a sense of international embarrassment. And you know, it's a shame that people feel that way because if you look at any of the big best picture winners, they're all critical of their countries. They're all exploring some kind of social issue and they don't feel embarrassed about it. It's something we have to be aware of, talk about, debate, but the embarrassment isn't particularly strong. But in Korea, the embarrassment would be more important than any mm. kind of discourse, unfortunately. What's the uh, impact of the western eye, so to speak, on Korean cinema. Um, it seems to me that there are a few movie directors that stood out because the West got an interest in them and actually domestically they weren't that known, at least in the beginning. For example, Kim ki uh, mm. his movies exploded in Europe and suddenly Koreans looked at it in a different way. Is that you know, something structural there? or yeah, That's a very, very interesting case with Kim ki because a lot of people, a lot of Korean cinema goers despise him and despise his films. <laughs> And his films are huge in Europe. I actually studied them at university, and they are marvellous films. But people in Korea don't particularly like them because of the violence and the misogyny. But in Europe, we, we kind of explore that. When I studied him, we were exploring, is Kim ki Duk a misogynist, or is he exploring misogyny within culture? And that's one of the key debates of what his films actually do. Uh, Hong Sang Su is another example. He's huge in Europe because of his no frills approach. He doesn't like studios. He likes these awkward interactions between people. Hugely successful. He's always on the Kaye du Cinema mm. top 10 list every year. In Korea, nothing. Most people don't even know who he is. And it's a real shame because there are so many talented directors that fulfill all these different realms. So, in that sense, the Western Eye doesn't matter as much as we would think. Uh, it's not as big yeah. as we think, yeah. no. It, it does help in terms of promoting films through film festivals. Uh, a lot of Korean films do go to film festivals throughout Europe and America, which does help to generate some buzz around it. But I think the Western eye probably applies the most when it came to uh, the, th the big three, Park Chan-wook, Bong Joon-ho and Kim Ji-yoon going to Hollywood recently because of their huge success with their past uh, filmography. But it's interesting again how they became popular in the West because 
their films were sold through an Asia Extreme line, you know, which is very unfair because Korean cinema and Asian cinema as a whole, there's so much variety. But DVD distributors were selecting the most violent, the <laughs> most dark, and then selling them and packaging them as Asia Extreme titles. And that is how a lot of these, well, the big three filmmakers came to Western countries through this line. So there's this very negative view of Korean cinema, unfortunately, through this. But it has helped them to uh, go into Hollywood, make some films, and hopefully their careers will continue. Hollywood is also coming to Korea. There were many uh, scenes being filmed in Korea these days. One example is The Born Legacy. The Avengers 2 was also shot in Gangnam. What does that tell us about Korea as a film location? It tells us that the uh, Korean film industry has very aggressive tax rebates. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more? Um, well, it is a very, very lucrative place. I don't know if you've seen recently, but London is also in films constantly. And that's because England also has very aggressive tax rebates. Same in Korea. They've, they've mirrored that, really. So companies that come here get a huge tax incentive. They save millions of dollars if they come here. But Hollywood in particular is very aware that Korea is an extremely lucrative market. Captain America 2 is a great example. And there's a scene where he has a little notebook and he writes things that he's missed and he needs to catch up on. And there was one that was specifically geared to Korea. And there was only about four or five countries in the world that the movie did that for. Hmm. And that says a lot that Marvel and Hollywood actually acknowledge how big this market is, how lucrative it is. So yeah, they're, they're not stupid Hollywood. They're very aware that this is a good place to get your movies in. The other way around, Korean directors um, are also making movies in the US. I think the one big example was Snowpiercer. Uh, there's also Stoker by Park Chan-wook. Is there something specifically Korean that they're trying to bring to the US or are they more, let's say, sucked into the big Hollywood machine? That's a very interesting question and I think it's something that scholars are going to be debating for quite some time because the big three did come to the attention of Hollywood through their films and there is this element of, wow, these guys were great, they were unpredictable, successful, let's bring them to Hollywood and see what they can do. But each director has had a very, very different experience. If you look at Park chan Stoker, that is a very uh, Hitchcockian style thriller. There isn't that kind of explosive sense of hand that we saw in his previous work. And the film, unfortunately, was not particularly successful because audiences just aren't used to that very slow Hitchcockian style these days. Even though it's a beautiful film, if you watch it, every scene is like a painting. It's gorgeous to look at. There's Kim ji Yoon. he struggled the most uh, when he went to Hollywood because in Korea, the director has control of everything. When he went to Hollywood, he had to share power with uh, producers and various other members of staff, and he did struggle. Uh, the Last Stand is not the disaster that a lot of people say it is, but he couldn't really imprint his own unique stamp on the film. The most successful is definitely Snowpiercer, but that is because CJ was one of the the big finances of it. So it was kind of a joint co-production where Bong Joon-ho did have more free reign to do what he wanted to get his vision on screen. And it was hugely successful and it was uh, it's wonderful to see that on an international stage. Harvey Weinstein was a little bit upset with Bong Joon-ho's cut of the film and he wanted to re-edit it and take several minutes out. And uh, Bong Joon-ho was very upset about that reportedly. So what Harvey Weinstein said was, we can do the Weinstein cut and release it uh, nationally throughout America and Canada, or we can do the Bong Joon-ho cut and we can do a, a, a lower release, we can experiment with it. And being the artist that he is, Bong Joon-ho decided to do his own cut, and then Snowpiercer was released through Video On Demand, it was released through sort of a, a new internet style of distribution. It was very successful, but it's also a real shame because Snowpiercer should have been so much more successful than it was. So yeah, the, there is a bit of a conflict there between Korean and American filmmakers, yeah, What was the main difference between the two cuts there? In all honesty, I'm not sure what Harvey Weinstein was upset with. He did want to take out certain issues, uh, certain social issues he wasn't happy with. He, he thought of it as streamlining, whereas Bong Joon-ho thought of it as fleshing out the particular narrative. 
But Harvey Weinstein has the nickname Scissor Hands for a reason, unfortunately. <laughs> Streamlining, does that mean dumbing down? Well, you said that, not me. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, let's move to um, the domestic movie industry now in South Korea. Um, last year, the movie Roaring Currents was seen by over 17 million people. That's a third of the population here in South Korea. <laughs> I mean, that's huge. Why are those numbers so high? Well, what's, why do Koreans go to the cinema more than apparently anybody else? Well, the film that you mentioned, uh, we touched on that a little bit earlier. Mm. It is something to do with putting it on so many screens that there is very little choice for anything else. I remember when I saw it at the cinema, I think it was about eight screens within a particular cinema only had this movie. So there is an element of, if you want to go to the cinema, this is your choice. But also, it is because Korea did have such a terrible year and they wanted to feel patriotic, they wanted to feel part of some kind of national unity. And the movie offered them that, uh, to be fair. It's not a particularly good film, it's very mediocre if you look at it from a, a narrative perspective or a filmmaking perspective. But it had this effect on the Korean people, it, it brought them up from this very sort of deep emotional sense of Han that they had from Sewol and several other issues of the year. So I think that is part of the reason why it was so successful. Just for our listeners, the Roaring Currents is also the Admiral Day. It's the yes, same movie, so we don't want people to be confused. <laughs> it has had a number of name changes, sorry about that. So if we look at the American movie industry, actually, it's stagnating. Um, we see rising costs, sinking revenues. In Korea, it's definitely not the case. Nine of the top 10 movies by admission numbers uh, were released in the last five years impressive amount of blockbusters coming out. Is Korean cinema kind of an outlier when it comes to international trends? Well, when it comes to Korean cinema, um, everything seems rosy. If you look at it on paper, 2014 was the first year that Korea passed uh, 2 trillion won in sort of generating money from the industry. However, if you look at it in more detail, uh, the film budgets are getting higher and less returns are coming back. So that is a certain issue. Um, so budgets are getting higher, things are looking a hell of a lot better than ever before, but the money's not coming back as such. As far as big blockbusters go, we do live in a very different world than uh, sort of five years ago, even that short time period. Companies are producing and distributing and marketing these films very differently, very aggressively these days, and there is that sense of dominance in the cinema industry. But uh, as you said, with American film, it is stagnating. So they're moving into China. Korea is following suit. I think there is a sense of the Korean industry worrying a little bit that they are copying the Hollywood system too much. And they are now starting to try and broaden their, their gaze, so to speak. So it is an exciting time. Things are getting better in terms of budgets and production values. But we need to have this creativity come through like from 10 years ago, like when the big three came through, like they were so inventive. And we need that to come through now in conjunction with these big budgets. Nine out of the 10 most popular movies ever shown in Korea were made in Korea. What does it tell us? Is it because uh, the Korean industry here gets its audience? Or is it again, as you mentioned, because they control what is shown in the cinemas anyway? It's a bit of both. Mm. If you look at films like The Admiral, Roar and Currents, or Ode to My Father, it's definitely both. Um, for the other films, they do tend to look at sort of things that are very specific to Korean culture, things that only Koreans could really deeply understand that would probably go over the heads of Western audiences. But that is one of the wonderful things about this industry, because they are Korean films for Korean people. And if you have any sort of sensibility about the culture, the history, political system, it's, it's wonderful to sort of take this in because it's so different to what we're used to in the West. But you wrote on your blog that you found 2014 a rather lackluster year for Korean cinema. But in 2014, we saw The Admiral, we saw Snowpiercer that had this you know, big inter international mm -hmm. release. So why were you not that enthusiastic? <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like a weird thing to say when you put it like that, because all of this money was being generated, records were shattered in both commercial and indie realms. But when I say 2014 was lackluster, it's purely in terms of uh, creativity. That is the problem. Independent film fared much better than commercial film. Films like Hang Gong Ju, A Girl at My Door, 
Um, but when it came to the commercial side of things, they were very mediocre. Uh, Miss Granny, that was the big film at the beginning of the year, very average. Gundo, that was very average. Uh, the Admiral, Pirates, all of these big blockbuster films, they generated huge amounts of money, but if you watch them, they're very average films. Why is that so? Is it because they need to appeal to the broadest audience possible? With Miss Granny, certainly, mm. yes, yes. There is this idea that we have to get audiences into these seats and get the money in. And yeah, there is a sense that this is more of a business than a creative industry uh, with certain products. But the independent film sector is moving forward with some very, very interesting stuff. So that tends to be where my interest lies these days. Uh, I really hope it doesn't continue that way because these, uh, I, I want to see independent directors become commercial directors. I want to see them infusing films with their own unique identities because that's what we had 10 years ago. Well, all of the directors that we consider big names now, they were young upstarts back then. They, they had this hunger and energy they were pouring into these movies. We need to see some more of that, I feel. To conclude, Simon, um, if someone would like to get a taste of Korean cinema, where do you start? What would you recommend as a representative, but at the same time accessible movie? Wow, uh, that is an enormous question. I suppose it depends on your preferences, really. Let me think. I, I suppose in terms of um, thriller drama, then Memories of Murder is a wonderful film. That's really incredible, based on a true story of a serial killer in uh, Suwon, near Seoul. So that's a very, very good film. Um, in terms of gangster action, A Bittersweet Life is fantastic. Uh, Poetry is a very good film by director Lee Chang-dong that explores uh, some of the social issues from an independent perspective. In terms of romance, uh, A Moment to Remember, that's wonderfully melodramatic, cliched, romantic tale. Uh, but it, it really does depend on uh, <laughs> what your preferences are. But uh, for me personally, if you want to get a real sense of Korea, I would suggest looking at independent cinema these days because that is where all of the interesting uh, explorations of Korean culture are coming from. What's your favorite Korean movie? I know it's a very difficult question, but I'm sure you have your favorite. I do. Uh, it's Poetry by director Lee Chang-dong. It explores a particularly painful social issue in Korea that I only really became aware of through watching this film. And I was thinking about it for days afterwards. It's one of those films that just stays with you long in the memory. So for me, if you like sort of slow social investigative <laughs> films, then I would definitely recommend Poetry. Simon, thank you so much for being our guest today. It's my um, pleasure. And I think it's important for our listeners to know that you have a great website and they should definitely check it out if they want to know everything about Korean cinema. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.